privileged and pleased and uh, happy to have um, Milford Bateman uh, with us uh, this evening. Milford is going to talk to us about his recent work on microfinance. Uh, and this is uh, an enormous privilege for us all. Milford is, in my opinion, the greatest specialist on this topic anywhere that has ever lived in the history of the world. Where's my check? <laughs> this is absolutely true, and this will be enormously uh, informative. So I've been looking forward to this session for, for a very long time. Um, on my left, Dr. Tom Mahua from the Department of Development Studies will be the uh, discussant of the session uh, tonight. So the structure will be the usual one where the speaker will be uh, presenting his paper for 30 to 40 minutes and then Tom as the, discussion, as the discussant will launch some topics for our conversation and then we'll open up for uh, questions. After the session, after the questions, etc., we have a small reception ups upstairs at the senior common room to which uh, everyone is uh, invited. Uh, thanks very much. Um, there will be a sheet of paper circulating in this room asking you if you wish to leave your contact details so we can get back to you with more extraordinarily interesting activities in our seminar series and other activities organized by the Department of Development Studies. So thanks very much uh, for this. Uh, Tom, shall I uh, pass it um, to you first? Sure. So in addition to the pleasure of being a discussant, at no extra charge, I've also agreed to chair the session for uh, tonight. Um, and I just want to say a few introductory words about, about Milford, Milford Bateman. Uh, you know, as you would have read, he's a freelance consultant currently, as I understand, working on UNCTAD's trade and development report for 2016 in terms of the debt and development stream of that report. He hails to us uh, from the Department of Economics, and I'm going to slaughter the name, uh, Juraj Jure Dobrila University of Pula, Croatia. But also, he's a visiting professor uh, from the Development Studies Department at St. Mary's University in Halifax, where we have common friends, old friends of mine in common as well. Um, and on this topic of microfinance, as the most extraordinary, world-famous leading expert on it, uh, you know, he has obviously published widely. One of his most known books is titled, Why Doesn't Microfinance Work? Uh, 2010Z. And then a recent Jacobin article just out a week or so ago, or maybe a little bit more, titled, The Power of a Dollar Microcredit is Nothing More Than a Socially Validated Way for <laughs> Financial Elites to Exploit the Poor. Typically, the convention is to also list off a few other of your more academic articles, and I'm not going to. I'm instead going to you know, give you more of a personal uh, introduction or, or compliment, if you will, that it's always, a, I think, a, a, a mark of a scholar that, you know, I teach in debt development and I use your work repeatedly. And I use it in my teaching. It's a very authoritative work and my students, in turn, use it in their works. And I think that's one of the greatest compliments I can pay to someone. Uh, and with that, he's going to speak to us today on his second provocative title, uh, From Zorro to Zombie, Explaining the Dramatic Rise and Fall of the Microcredit Model as Development Policy. Thank you, Milford. Okay, well, after that uh, fantastic introduction, I'm a little bit uh, overwhelmed, but uh, great to be here again. I was here a couple of years ago and really enjoyed it. And the air conditioning wasn't working then, I seem to remember, so there's nothing that seems to have changed. Um, uh, you know, there's something needs to be done about that. But uh, So what I want to do, what I'm wanting to do uh, tonight is really to take the argument on uh, and to come to an idea that um, the whole sort of microcredit, microfinance angle is pretty much confirmed as a dead duck and uh, to explain why it is that it's still out there somehow. Uh, like a zombie, it keeps rising from the dead and it lumbers into town to terrorise the local people. So I want to, uh, under the name of what's called financial inclusion. So I just want to do a little bit about why there's a problem there and then just uh, introduce the idea that they're trying to keep something that really should have died. They're trying to keep it alive for reasons other than the stated reasons. Um, so let me just go through just a little bit, which uh, I think some of, most of you will be, will be familiar with anyway. Um, uh, the microcredit model, and I'm mainly talking about microcredit. The two terms microcredit, microfinance are interchangeable, 
but I'm mainly talking about microcredit unless it becomes clear that I'm talking about the much wider issue of microfinance, which includes micro savings, micro insurance, micro leasing, uh, all sorts of other stuff. So uh, the original microcredit idea really was a product of politics back in the 1960s when in Latin America we had a lot of uh, populations that were get, getting very restive about the way that capitalism or military capitalism was going and the way the US government there was really dictating the terms um, and economic policies there. And so it arose out of a US government response to uh, this sort of rising uh, anger and the fear of another Cuba. That was always in the mind of many policymakers in the US government. And they wanted an, a something that they could offer to the poor in Latin America in order to basically say, well, look, you know, don't look for these radical solutions. Help is on the way. And, you know, you might find something in some of these things that we're promoting. And one of the things they promoted was this idea of self-help and individual entrepreneurship. And alongside that really came this idea of microcredit. So the poor, by definition, hadn't the resources to engage in petty business activities, but with a little bit of microcredit, they could actually move into that area. And then you could say to them, look, you know, uh, help is on the way, you're doing something, and then if you have one or two success stories in every thousand people that try it, you can put those, not on the websites in the 60s, but you could flag up those uh, examples to say, look, it's working, um, you know, don't follow the sort of leftist tide or liberation theology, uh, you know, help is on the way, you're going you're gonna to get better. Um, and it all boiled down to, as well, really not so much any economic progress for the poor, but in, 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 many, in a real sense, simply the opportunity for the poor to get a little bit of uh, a little piece of the action with the help of microcredit. And this is a very powerful organizing principle, the idea of opportunity. We know that it underpins the American dream, for example, um, that you know, all that matters is not the outcome, which might mean that one in a thousand actually has some benefit. What matters is that you have the opportunity to be the one in a thousand. So they tried to sell the idea that things would become uh, uh, better for the poor. But then, of course, Muhammad Yunus then comes into the story in Bangladesh. So he arrives back in Bangladesh after a period of study and teaching in the US, sees the microcredit models, and decides that well, this, is, this is the way he wants to go down. He made a few adjustments to the existing microcredit model, bringing in something called social collateral, where you don't need physical or financial collateral, but merely you have a group and everybody guarantees everybody else. So if one member of the group doesn't pay, the other members of the group have to contribute to pay the defaulting member. So with a, an innovation, a few innovations like that, uh, uh, Muhammad Yunus then became the, the, the father figure, if you like, of the, uh, of, the, of, the micro, of the burgeoning microcredit movement. He was able to get a lot of support from US agencies and US right-wing foundations. And so he was able to set up his own uh, bank, uh, the Grameen Bank. And his essential message to the poor was very similar in Latin America, which was that he was going to bring capitalism down to the poor. So the poor always felt shut out by what was going on um, in the elite sections. They weren't uh, getting in on the benefit, but now what his message was that they actually could uh, benefit um, from what was going on. In fact, Yunus went even further than that, and in order to sell the idea, he made rather ludicrous statements about eradicating poverty in a generation and uh, our children will go to a poverty museum to see what this issue of poverty was all about. So he basically was able to mobilize the resources to get this idea about microcredit um, onto the uh, agenda. But very uh, centrally supporting his ideas were the World Bank and particular USA idea because they had in mind at the time a particular version of capitalism just coming into vogue in the 1980s, which we now know as neoliberalism or the Washington Consensus. So this really was resonated with the World Bank and USAID, this idea that the poor would be included within capitalism. So that accounted for a lot of the support that Yunus uh, got. So very soon the idea was going all over the world, other countries were taking benefit, that Africa then became uh, a place where microcredit was supported. 
then went back to Latin America. It was in most parts of Asia. And then after 1990, it went into post-communist Eastern Europe as well. By the 2000s, it was the most important development policy in terms of attention, funding, political support, and popular support. So it really was uh, uh, important. And there are many famous quotes, and I just gave one. Microcredit is the vaccine for the pandemic of poverty. So it was just assumed now, it was, it was very, very concretely thought within the international development community that microcredit was the, was the way out. And so that was really what was, what was going on there. But there was just one more change in order that the microcredit model really colonized everything in the international development community. Because the initial microcredit model was very much a subsidized, non-governmental-led model. Okay? So World Bank and USAID appreciated the idea of self-help and the idea of individual entrepreneurship, but they hated the idea that it was all subsidized. So somehow that had to be taken out. And the way forward was to turn it into a business, okay? to commercialize it, to privatize it, to marketize it, or really essentially to neoliberalize the whole concept. And even when they turned it into a business, there was always the understanding that somehow these new for-profit market-driven institutions would responsibly lend to the poor. And as I'll come on to, that clearly wasn't the case. Um, and so you had a lot more of the institutions, along with the World Bank and USID, then uh, taking, taking this whole idea forward. And it became the anti-poverty and bottom-up development intervention of all time. It had a very seductive uh, attraction to it. It basically supposed to show that capitalism or bottom-up capitalism or granulated capitalism, as some have called it, actually works. Okay? So the poor don't really need to call for, how to say, traditional uh, uh, um, interventions on their behalf, like welfare programs, like an active state, like wealth redistribution, because they're going to get their benefit on their own terms through individual entrepreneurship. So you can imagine how important, how seductive that was to the international <coughs> development community, that they wouldn't have the poor wanting to form trade unions or social mobilization or petitioning the state to do things or electing a left-wing government. All they needed was microcredit. So you can see how that was powerful to uh, elites within the international development uh, community. And the other really nasty aspect that came out of it is that if the poor remained in poverty, and that's again, I'll come on to, that's largely what happened, if they remain in poverty, well, then maybe it's their fault. First of all, if they don't access a microcredit, well then, you know, you had your opportunity, you chose not to take part in it, therefore it's your problem. But even if they did take a microcredit and they failed, well, you know, that's the way the game goes. And it was a way of putting the blame for being in poverty back onto the poor. So this was a very powerful organizing uh, uh, principle that the poor could now be blamed for their own poverty. They had all the attractions, all the instruments to hand. And if they were still in poverty, well, maybe they were doing things not right. Okay? So that was, they, that was an important aspect of it. So microcredit really became the Zorro of interventions, and it comes into town, helps the peasants escape from their poverty and exploitation. So it was seen as a very positive intervention, something that really is going to be benefiting. And then it all collapsed. Then the whole idea basically collapsed. Um, where did it start? Well, it started initially in Bolivia because the Bolivian economy was the test bed for the commercialized variant of microcredit. So Bangladesh, if you like, was the, the start of the microcredit experiment, uh, but Bolivia was used as the test bed for commercialized microcredit. And what happened was that the market expanded, lots of new entrants came in, and they blew the whole market up in around 99, 2000. Now, at the time, it was said that this was just a one-off. This was a special case. won't happen anywhere else because markets are smart. People learn. Bankers are smart. Bankers are responsible, responsible, so this won't happen again. But then it started happening again on a regular basis. In Bosnia, Morocco, Pakistan, Nicaragua, 
Um, and then we have a huge crash in Andhra Pradesh, which is really instructive of the motivations and the incentives and how destructive they are in a very Wall Street style sense. We also had the, it also became clear that instead of uh, uh, engaging in the whole microcredit movement in order to benefit the poor, it became quite clear that the equation was the other way around, that people were moving into the microcredit uh, movement in order to <laughs> extract resources from the poor. So in very many cases, we had the case of Banco Compartamos in Mexico, where the uh, original owners became multimillionaires, the shareholders made four, five, six hundred million dollars, and that started a lot more examination from a sort of an independent perspective on what microcredit was really all about. And then very quickly we had a lot of revelations about most microcredit institutions were basically about enriching the senior managers and the shareholders. And the idea of poverty alleviation was something that was bolted on and was mainly promoted by the PR department. Then we had um, a rather explosive document came out the British government at the time was getting really pissed off with all these uh, surveys and, 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 and comment about microcredit not working. So they commissioned um, a, a survey uh, of all the previous evidence pertaining to microcredit that said it had a positive impact. So they gathered a team of microcredit specialists and evaluation experts. One of them is here, Marin Duvendak is here in the audience. Um, and the Duvendak report, as it's called, basically poured water on the idea that these previous um, uh, impact evaluations actually said anything positive about microcredit. They couldn't actually find anything. It's a great report to have a look at. And their conclusion was really quite explosive because it said the case for microfinance has essentially been built on foundations of sand. Okay? So that, was, that really had an important impact within uh, the international development community. It was one of the first that actually, and the most important survey because it had a huge number of cases that they looked at. Three and a half thousand impact evaluations um, were used. And then to get you right up to date, um, uh, we had the sort of breakdown of the randomized control trial. So this is a method of evaluation that is supposed to be more accurate. And so a lot of the people who were using this said, well, this will show that microcredit has a real impact. And unfortunately, it didn't. Okay? It basically said that there is really no uh, impact from microcredit or a tiny impact. So basically, the whole thing is, uh, is hardly worth the candle. So very quickly on the fundamental points, um, one of the big problems with microcredit is it was, it was founded on a fundamental misunderstanding okay? by, by Muhammad Yunus, basically. And Mohammed Yunus basically, his idea was that if you provide microcredit in small villages in Bangladesh, then the poor will be able to produce something, sell it locally, and they will be able to get themselves out of poverty. So Yunus, in a sense, configured poverty as a supply problem. People need a little bit of help in order to produce something locally. But the problem of poverty isn't really so much about that. It's more about the demand. The poor, by definition, don't have the resources to buy what they need within their community. The resources, the things they need are actually, in most cases, there, but they don't actually have the resources to consume these things. Okay? And that's the real problem. And we call it, in economics, it's called Say's Law, the idea that supply creates its own demand. And it's been debunked so many times. But Yunus believed in that, that if he could get everybody producing tiny little things in the village, that somehow, among the same poor community, there would be the demand to, to do that. And by and large, that doesn't actually operate. And it's very interesting that it, it was a misunderstanding similar to Amartya Sen, who said that, uh, that uh, famines were about a lack of food, <laughs> when in most cases, or in many cases, it's really about purchasing power. The poor don't have the purchasing power to consume what is, in many cases, actually available. So it's a similar logic or a, a similar logical error. And that's one of the reasons why we can't find any real evidence that microcredit creates any employment or any uh, uh, really uh, uh, higher incomes within the community because um, already those types of things that people want to do are already being supplied. So if I move into the community to provide baskets, 
generally I put out of business the person sat next to me already providing baskets. And we call that displacement. Okay? So in many poor communities, as I say, there isn't really a problem of the supply, so adding to the supply really isn't the solution. So that's one of the fundamental uh, problems. And one of the reasons why, because a lot of uh, people in, uh, in difficulty realized that there was nothing with a microcredit that they could produce and sell, they said, well, look, you know, it isn't going to get me anywhere, only into more debt, as I'll come on to. I might as well just use it to buy whatever I need to survive through to the next month. So that's why we had a rise in the amount of microcredit going into consumption spending. Partly because the poor understood that there's nothing that can be done in my community with a small microcredit that isn't already being done. Okay? And so that's uh, just a rather, you know, the, the, it superficially looks good, but when you look into it in a little more, little more detail, you realize something's actually missing there. Second point is microcredit doesn't really address the key issues that we know come through in uh, economic development, okay? And this boils down to an idea about what sort of enterprises do we need when we're trying to develop uh, a, a, a local economy. Now, we actually have quite a lot of information on what sort of enterprises the successful economies used in order to develop. And I've given a, 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 you know, just some ideas there. They have to be formally registered. They should be operating at minimum efficient scale. They should be operating as near as possible to the technology frontier, using new technologies and innovations. They should be driven by skills and innovation. They should be connected in some way, either ver vertically or horizontally, and they should be able to create new things, new organizations and routines, okay? new ways of doing things. That's not what informal micro-enterprises do. So to the extent that they start to take the resources, then you're actually sending developing economies off in completely the wrong direction. And that's what we're seeing very much today. As the microcredit model gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the amount of money left over for more productive purposes is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay? So that's one of the critical problems. Uh, uh, and you can, there's so much evidence on that, really. It's uh, untrue. And so that, well, one of the key aspects of this is what we call crowding out. So the more money that's actually put into informal micro-enterprises, that money is no longer available. And in many cases, it's coming out of funding for more productive enterprises. And we call this crowding out. I would have a look at the, if you're interested in that, the Age of Productivity, a publication by the Inter-American Development Bank, which goes into this in some considerable detail. It doesn't actually name microcredit as the guilty party, but if you read between the lines, you can see that it is. Okay? And they say that poverty in Latin America is a function of the, mis, uh, the, 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 the weak intermediation of funds into the best possible enterprises. Instead, it goes into the worst possible enterprises. And that's becoming more and more of a problem. 45% of Cambodia's financial resources are now intermediated and put into informal micro-enterprises and consumption spending. Okay? So that's a huge amount going into street selling. So why are we surprised that Cambodia is not really developing? Bolivia, 37% of its resources goes into the informal microcredit uh, sector, rising from about 2% 25 years ago. This is big money that's moving, shifting out of the most productive uses into the most unproductive. South Africa, huge amount of finance has been raised. Mainly it goes actually into consumption spending, but what doesn't go into consumption spending goes into street trading. So again, why are we surprised that they're not really developing the most productive enterprises? There's also a crowding out aspect in terms of uh, the market, because the informal enterprises shine for a little bit, take a little bit of demand in the market from more formal enterprises that could use it, and then they collapse. So they're actually a barrier to the development of the most productive enterprises. So that's another area we have to consider. Particularly, I looked at some reports in Bolivia where if you look at World Bank surveys, the most important thing that managers in formal businesses, the most important barrier to them is competition from the informal sector. They're not able to get larger to deploy technology because their demand, their market share is being eaten away 
nipped away at all these informal enterprises that only last a couple of years and then go under. Okay, so that's a real problem for them. <coughs> and very much as in Africa, the more, in a sense, the more micro-entrepreneurs we have doing this uh, situation, crowding out in terms of the financial sector and the market, that's the reason why uh, uh, underdevelopment really is taking place. So this is something, you know, the microcredit books would say, and the reality is a buy cheap, sell dear type of economy. In other words, not really going to be going anywhere. Final problem is that when we converted the original microcredit model to uh, uh, neoliberal principles, um, it turned it into a Wall Street style disaster. So the idea, as I said earlier, was that if we convert these non-governmental organizations into profit-seeking organizations, bankers and those involved will, will behave responsibly. Okay? Even though we deregulate, light-touch regulation, somehow the belief in the textbooks, founded in the textbooks, well, would be that they would behave responsibly. Well, they actually haven't, because in every country where we have had a, where microcredit has reached a significant threshold, we've had a boom and then we've had a bust. In other words, they can't be trusted under a deregulated environment to behave responsibly. So something's actually fundamentally wrong with the business model, okay? And it's not something that's country specific because it's happening everywhere. And so, as I, sa as I said earlier, the, the drive for maximum profit now in microcredit is driving the money away from the most productive enterprises and putting it towards the most unproductive enterprises. Um, uh, and that's obviously having a very uh, 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 deleterious effect on the local economy because it contributes to what I've well, to processes of deindustrialization, of primitivization, that's moving from fairly technologically uh, sound companies and then moving to no technology companies. Um, and informalizing, so you're informalizing the economy, taking it from a state where, where there's respect for the law and trade unions and labor rights, taking it into a very much more going back in time, basically. And so I think one of the aspects that comes out of the neoliberalization is that if you've come across David Harvey's concept of accumulation by dispossession, that wealth is now not necessarily produced in companies through innovations, but it's wealth generated by taking existing wealth from another group in society. So it's actually wealth that's being taken out of poor communities in the form of interest payments and taken up to elite groups. And Harvey calls this accumulation by dispossession. I would also have a look at a new book that's just come out called The Financialization of Poverty, which looks at that in a particular microcredit um, uh, uh, scenario. And, and the author, Phil Mader, is, is here. I would definitely have a look at, uh, at that, and that, that builds upon the idea of accumulation by dispossession. So very quickly, what's to be done? Well, I think most, even long-time supporters now accept that microcredit was a failed, a flawed idea. And it, it succeeds only in the sense um, that it's a great way of validating pre-existing ideas about capitalism, that self-help and individual entrepreneurship are somehow magnificent beasts, and with a little bit of microcredit, this can really work. So basically, the microcredit movement validated that really important argument that is beholden of people like, of institutions like the World Bank, USAID, and very much the sort of neoliberals. But it also allows um, elites to make a lot of money. And so that's what they're doing through investing in microcredit institutions, through giving them loanable funds through basically engaging uh, with that. Um, if you see, I mean, the two, two of the biggest supporters now of the microcredit movement are Visa and MasterCard. Now, you might argue, well, they're there because there's, the directors are really interested in poverty reduction. I would say there's not much evidence of that. So they have other ulterior motives. And very similar to the tobacco companies, that when their market was disappearing in the West, they moved to developing countries and started building up demand there and they're making, a, they're making a lot of money there. So I think the motivation is very similar to the tobacco industry. Um, they're moving into new areas and they're hoping that by putting the poor in debt that there's a tribute that's going to go uh, back up. So for those two ideological and financial profit reasons, the microcredit model must be saved. So the call went out, the microcredit 
model must be saved. And of course, the World Bank comes to the rescue. So the World Bank was seeing that the microcredit model was failing. They've, uh, uh, they've realized this for a while now. They've understood the implications for the ideological content of what they do. If it's actually shown that individual entrepreneurship, which is the basis of almost the entire neoclassical economics uh, uh, paradigm, if it's shown, well, actually, that isn't how wealth is created, that isn't how countries develop, then you can see that the radical implications of that um, uh, are not to the liking of the World Bank. So also the idea that financial corporations based many in the United States, but also Europe, can make big money out of microcredit, that's something that must be saved. There's nothing wrong with that as far as the World Bank is concerned. So the call went out, we have to save microcredit some way. The way they did it was to rebadge it, to call it something else, or to mix it with something else. And they're calling it financial inclusion. Okay? Um, so the poor now don't need just a microcredit. They need a whole array of services. And for unspecified, unknown reasons, somehow that is what's going to be the answer to, to poverty in developing countries. So no research has been produced on this. No, there's no transmission mechanism of, about how including the poor in this array of financial services is going to deliver the goods. But it goes ahead. And the World Bank and USAID have basically committed themselves to achieving universal financial inclusion by 2020. Okay, so this, and microcredit has now been, in a sense, subsumed under this financial inclusion uh, uh, mandate. And so it still lives on. Um, I, I put the quote there, but Paul Krugman said, and I thought this was very good, that when you see an ever-changing rationale for a never-changing policy, then something smells. Okay? So the idea that, uh, that microcredit still works, but now we call it something else, then something's not going on there. So it's largely a fraudulent um, intervention, um, uh, but it's, it's with a design to keep something alive that perhaps should be, should be allowed to die. So my conclusion then is microcredit has now evolved into what we might call a zombie idea. Okay? It just exists. It's a dead idea. Even most economists associated with it will say, well, you know, there isn't really any evidence that it works. So all that activity, all that mobilization of finance, uh, all the World Bank's activity really doesn't actually produce anything. Um, but it's kept alive for other reasons. For neoliberals and neoclassical economists, if you were to say that individual entrepreneurship is not the foundation of all wealth creation, that would be, that is just too, too much. Okay? So somehow the concept has to, be, has to be preserved. It's too powerful a concept to allow it to, to die out uh, just because it doesn't actually work. Okay? And so my conclusion would be, if there is one more disaster, and there are several brewing around the world, uh, Mexico, for a couple of years now, has been on the edge of a, of a total meltdown. There's, the figures coming out of Mexico are quite shocking in terms of the extent of over-indebtedness. One of the projects that Tom mentioned I'm working on at the moment is looking at the extent of this debt, this over-indebtedness. How is it formed? What can be done about it? What are the driving forces behind it? And what are the implications for the national economy? If my, Mexico's microcredit sector goes, goes belly up, what are the implications? Uh, not just for the poor, but for the rest of the economy. Peru is, in, is, is, is hugely over-indebted. Um, enormous amounts of money. Bangladesh is still over-indebted. They saved a meltdown a couple of years ago um, by getting everybody together and knocking their heads and basically saying, look, stop with the growth, okay? Stop with the profiteering. Try to share the market between you because if you guys go under, the whole thing's going to go bust. So then the, the graph of expansion then wrap tailed off and now it's down. But there's still big problems there. And India, just four or five years after a big collapse, a lot of the signs are that India now, the, the companies that are involved are doing the same things. 
lending to the poor in, in, in areas where they shouldn't be, they, they, they have no collateral, they have no, they have no business uh, acumen, um, securitizing loan, port, micro loan portfolios, all the bad things that they did in 2010, the Wall Street style bad things, they're now starting to do again as people's memories fade of what happened before and, and they created an entirely new narrative that it was all the government's fault so we can go on doing what it is we can do. So I think if we have one more collapse then I think the, the, that might be a game changer but we'll have to see whether that collapse comes about. So I hope that was something. I think I ran through that a little bit fast, but I think I'm on time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just a quick housekeeping. Um, if you're so inclined to tweet, you can tweet your comments to pound SOAS, S-O-A-S, dev, D-E-V, studies, all together, S-T-U-D-I-E-S, or you can also tweet to pound ESRC. You want to say anything else on that? No. Okay. Um, so I've been asked to offer, I, I guess, some comments or interventions into this. And seeing it's hot um, and the style that I like to engage is to sort of increase the temperature a little bit myself. So there's three things I want to briefly, in a sense, question you or ask for some clarification. Um, or point towards, I think, or significant issues and questions within the microfinance literature. The first is historical. And you laid out a history of microfinance that begins in the 1960s, 70s. And my question is, could it have been otherwise? The evolution of microfinance, the nature in which it is today, its profit motivation. And I ask that because there are plenty of other, and I'm, I know you're aware of these, historical examples of microfinance-like relationships within communities where people collectively pool gold together and lend it to their neighbors or collectively share resources among communities. And has a very different social logic. So why, in a sense, or could, the, the basic question is, could it have been differently? And could it have been more progressive in its evolution? The second one has to do with the, the very significant issue of the question of, of uh, conceptual question of alternatives. And you pointed uh, to, the, to the question of crowding out microfinance and resources being absorbed there. And then pointing, in a sense, towards the alternatives uh, of a developmental state, pointing towards Amsden and, and Chang. Um, one thing, and, and then, you know, this question of, of industrialization, more formalized enterprise. So my, my, my conceptual question there is what then, what is fundamentally different or what distinguishes the neoliberal model of microfinance between what is ultimately a neoliberal model of industrialization elsewhere? So how would the alternatives you're pointing to in terms of industrialization differ in the profit motiva motivation of the, the ultimate goals of microfinance today. So what's, what distinguishes those two models? And why should we take, it, take your word on the more formal sector as leading to something better or fundamentally different than the neoliberal model of microfinance today? So it's kind of a conceptual thing, if you will. Uh, similar problems, slightly different outcomes. But tied to that, what then is the source of finance in that model? So you're, you're, you're posing a productive response to a microfinance model. How do we finance the, the, the sort of industrialization model? What alternatives ex exist there? The third intervention then, in, in a sense, is more practical. So the first one, historical. Second one, kind of conceptual. Third one, in a sense, practical. And I, I see you're, you're getting warm. <laughs> um, and this is the question of the agents of change. Because in a, in a, clearly there's a consensus that there needs to be some change and that there are different uh, beneficiaries and that global finance has absolutely, you know, global financial actors have absolutely benefited from this, no doubt. The, the profit levels are incredible. But to some extent, it seems like you're relying on crisis to bring microfinance to an end. And I'm wondering if you can point to some organized movements some agents of change who are pushing for change, uh, and, and what kind of strategies might we share with our audience here in terms of more hopeful, you know, moving forward, rather than waiting you know, for Mexico to collapse? What, what kind of alternatives out, are out there that exist that we might look forward to? That's it. Okay, uh, I don't need to, uh, uh, 
talk loud enough as it is. Uh, so, the, you think? Oh, for the recording, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, the, well, the history, could it have been otherwise? That's, I mean, that's an interesting point, but I think the tragedy was that um, as the neoliberal paradigm was arising in the early 1980s, it ran into the microcredit model, and um, it could only use this particular model to its own for its own uses. I mean, it, it, you know, so the tra part of the tragedy of the microcredit model is that it came up against neoliberalism at a time when uh, it was still in its infancy, if you like. It was a non-governmental organization model. Without the influence of neoliberalism, maybe it would have stayed a very marginal, a very partial, very small-scale model in just one or two communities, and we wouldn't have heard from it ever again. But because neoliberalism came along at the same time and they could see enormous usefulness in what the microcredit uh, uh, advocates were, were pushing, the idea that individual entrepreneurship is really the be-all and end-all of poverty uh, alleviation, that you don't need to, to, uh, to uh, deploy what we might call collective capabilities. You don't need to form trade unions, electing left-wing parties, all that sort of stuff. Um, they realized that microcredit had a huge usefulness. And so they entered into the, financed and supported the main advocates, people like Mohamed Yunus, people like Hernando de Soto, financed all the campaigns because they wanted the ideological points. And then later on, when it became a profit business, then obviously they realized that that was a way to um, uh, get the profit motive into microcredit on behalf of another constituency. So I think... Um, it was unfortunate that it, it arose in a sense when it did, um, but neoliberalism has destroyed or has co-opted many other interventions and built them up into something big only for them to crash later. So I don't think microcredit um, is the only one that it did. So in terms of alternatives, I mean, uh, um, that is one thing that a lot of people say, you know, what are the alternatives to microcredit? I mean, I think they are, they are out there um, and... Uh, I think there, there is a lot of uh, support for um, uh, alternative development trajectories. We have many historical examples of local development. I mean, I give good examples from northern Italy after 1945. Had a totally different consensus-based, uh, community-based model, which turned uh, a region of Italy, which was one of Europe's poorest, into one of the richest. And it was based on on a respect for cooperation, on a respect for working together, on an idea that we needed the latest technologies. We don't want to just work for very simple businesses. We need the latest technologies into our businesses. Lots of ideas, and they built a successful model. Same in many parts of Germany with, you know, building on different constituencies coming together. You had regional governments, powerful trade unions, chambers of commerce coming together and creating uh, a decent model. So I think there are alternatives out there. And I think just, uh, I mean, one of the, uh, uh, I mean, Latin America was one of the first countries. And I think it's interesting that Brazil was probably the, the pioneer in this case. 1960s, USAID financed proposals in Recife in Brazil. So that was one of the first uh, microcredit uh, uh, um, movements. And now Brazil has come full circle. And I, I just got back from Brazil a couple of weeks ago where I was invited over by one of the biggest state banks in the state of Minas Gerais. And uh, they are looking for an alternative to microcredit. So the politicians are saying, well, look, you know, microcredit, we're hearing great things about it. So as our state development bank, you really should be getting into it. And the officers um, were putting up some resistance. So they invited a, you know, a critic to come in and, and discuss. And at the end of it, I think most people were agreeing that, you know, we have to think carefully and maybe about introducing microcredit or at least beefing up the programs they have and starting to look at alternatives in the form of maybe uh, more lending to formal small and medium enterprises, big uh, movement there towards supporting cooperatives. So there's other things to do it. There's other ways, municipal enterprises um, in Brazil, I mean, all over the world, they privatize municipal services into private companies. It's been a complete disaster. Brazil is one of those countries that are remunicipalizing things like water, uh, uh, you know, garbage collection, things like that. And so I think those, those are, that, that's a, a way of supporting those types of um, uh, alternatives. Um, so I think the, the alternatives are out there, um, and I think um, 
I think I've answered the agents of change question. The way. Another one I would, I would look at is countries like Cuba, which have, are now uh, um, on, the, on the cusp of, of accepting things like microcredit because the US constituents is really pushing them hard to accept this, this wonder drug from the West called microcredit. And one of the ways they're doing it is, of course, uh, sponsoring tours and research fellowships at the prestigious institutions in the States so that people then have a buy-in to this microcredit and they don't want to listen to any argument that says it's perhaps not very good for them. But the government is actually pushing ahead with, with uh, measures to try to finance the conversion of state-owned small businesses into workers' co-ops. And they can't do that with microcredit. And they realize that they don't want to go down um, the Eastern European. Uh, they followed the economy of Bosnia very closely as a transition economy that went from a form of communism into a, a form of, of capitalism, which has been pretty much a disaster. And they don't want to follow that. So they're looking at the, the financial institutions that Bosnia didn't deploy development banking, financial cooperatives, community banking, and did deploy. They had a massive, uh, second only to Bangladesh in terms of the penetration, the microcredit sector. And they're, they're realizing that the alternatives, uh, uh, types of financial institutions would be better for Cuban conditions. So I think, um, I think I've answered two of the questions together, but I think that the alternatives are out there. But I was also I mean, I, I've, I've researched, I've worked a lot in credit unions, which are saver-owned financial institutions. Now, I always think we're setting something up in Croatia, where I spend most of my time. And these are, re these are great. They're not, they're not about making a profit. They're about providing a service to savers, which means usually if you need a loan, you can get a cheap loan because it's your own money. It's not about making uh, money for the shareholders. There aren't any shareholders. You're all, all you have one vote, one share, one vote. And the World Bank ha was very anti credit unions in the 1980s as they were starting to push up the support for microcredit. And one of the reasons was, um, to summarize, is there ain't no way for someone to make money in a credit union. But there is in microcredit. And so what they felt, credit unions are a form of fuzzy sort of community activity, whereas microcredits, you can get an entrepreneur in there, make a lot of money, pump out a load of microcredit. And they didn't think credit unions offer that opportunity for somebody to make money. Now I would say, well, yeah, what's wrong with that? But everything, in a sense, the World Bank was doing in the 1980s and 90s, there had to be some money-making potential for somebody, because if there wasn't, it meant it was for the service of the community. Well, how lame is that? You know, so, so they didn't support credit unions because there was this issue of, you know, well, what's your average entrepreneur? How can an entrepreneur make money out of a credit union? Well, the answer is he can't, you know, he or she can't. Well, then why are we going to support credit unions? So that was one of the reasons why credit unions were, in a sense, avoided in the debate about financial institutions in the global south in the 80s and 90s. Now, the situation is changing now, and rather... Suspiciously, the World Bank has jumped on the credit union model now and is starting to promote the credit union model. Not quite sure why. Maybe they realize the error of their ways or maybe this is a good bit of camouflage if they're seen to be associating with the forward-looking credit union model. Maybe people won't, will forget all the other things that they did. Uh, so I'm not quite clear why. But there's a lot more support from the World Bank now for credit unions. So I hope I answered those points. No, very much. Thank you, thank you. Um, just before we go into questions, and Alfredo is going to chair that, just a, a quick uh, notice or announcement for next Tuesday, not steal your thunder, there's no, we got plenty of thunder, so I'm just stealing a little bit, maybe just a crack. Uh, Joan Martinez Allier will be speaking to us on, is there a global movement for environmental justice? Uh, same time, same place? Same time, same place. Okay, notice will come out. Uh, with that, and a reminder to tweet widely, enormously. Um, <coughs> Questions, comments, uh, yes, opportunities here. My name's Paul Hudson, I'm no longer a fixed academic abode. Thank you very much for your talk. It's really, it's a simply enlightening talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question. I think it follows on from uh, Tom's first question to some extent. I'm almost acting as a devil's advocate to some extent, but that's to sharpen up the issue. I couldn't quite understand, and that reflects, of course, a lot of my ignorance about the situation in various developing countries. I admit my ignorance uh, openly. That even in um, 
a so-called developed country like um, Britain, even small and medium-sized enterprises, over half of them have been going bust since the 1980s. And Mrs. Thatcher's day, 79% of them are going bust within two years. It's now down to only 59% within two years. And now if those um, small in, uh, and medium enterprise mm -hmm. enterprises are not run by people who are in the such dire market as you have in mm -hmm. Bangladesh and Bolivia and elsewhere, mm -hmm. um, what, what, what prospect was there the, of, of this actually working? What right. does um, Mohammed Yunus actually think of this idea? Mm -hmm. I think it was a that one. Can I take some? Uh, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So okay. Yes. Yes, you. Okay. Um, I just wondered if you, wondered if you could comment a little bit on cash transfers and cash transfer as a <coughs> Um, I don't know if anybody's read Jim Ferguson's new book, Giving Man a Fish, and he addresses cash transfers kind of like a um, <coughs> solution that targets both the demand and the supply side of property. So I was just wondering if you had anything to say about that, particularly given someone like Modi's government is planning to roll them out universally um, in the next uh, coming year. OK, thank you. Uh, someone at the back, yes. That's what I disagreed with in uh, the argument. Of course, the, the business model um, approach of reaping profits from the poor and the whole um, failure of microcredit in, say, Andhra Pradesh or SKS microfinance, I completely agree with. But um, there are alternative models within microfinance. Say, for instance, the self-help group way, which essentially harnesses collective capabilities and is very community-based. There's no external company that's facilitating the entire process. And there's enough evidence, which is not the one in a 1,000 uh, base, which clearly shows that self-help groups have helped uh, uh, the rural poor escape the interlocked modes of exploitation, which is essentially dependence on money lenders. Especially in developing countries like India, the money lender is the only source of credit that you have if you're not linked to a bank. So don't SAGs then provide access to credit in that sense? And the second is actually transitioning from the self-help group model to opening up your own bank account. And it has been seen that um, once you're a part of these SAGs, banks find it increasingly difficult to say no to you to open up bank accounts. And hence, it's actually helping uh, the un unbanked actually get access to banks. So um, I wanted to know your views of, on self-help groups as a model in the context of microcredit. And um, I've actually seen that work in a lot of parts in India. Should we leave it and, and, and answer these? And okay, that's off. fine. And then there'll be there'll be another round. Right. Okay. The the first one. That's that's an interesting question. I mean, I didn't have time to go into one of the one of the problems uh, uh, with microcredit is what you called uh, you know the failure and the statistics on the failure of informal micro enterprises uh, are very high. So the average lifespan is about three years, and then they they basically they come and they go. So it's it's very high. It's very high. But um, in impact, in evaluations of microcredit, one of the things that you don't you look at is you look at the startups, and then you create some jobs and some incomes, 
and then you don't really follow it through a couple of years later to find out what actually happened to them. So in, in a sense, one of the problems of impact evaluations, and I've done quite a few on, on local development, is that you tend to look at all the upsides, all the, the new startups, and then you're never there when, there's, when they fail in a couple of years' time. And the, average, the, the typical local economy in the Global South is subject more to something called turbulence or uh, churn, which is lots of new microenterprises and lots of failures. So the, 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 the number basically stays the same. You just have a high level of entry, but then with a lag you have a high level of exit. So really you're not actually creating very much other than this constant turnover. Um, and, uh, but the exit part has not been included in any of the valuations. And that was one of the points I made in, in the book I did. How is it that I was using you know, the, the exit, entry and exit in, in surveys I was doing, but yet most of the evaluators in microcredit only look at the entrance and say, look at this, we've had 100,000 US M, uh, new microenterprises, forgetting the fact that in two years later, 96,000 of them uh, go out of business, usually with debts for the people concerned. Um, interestingly, tomorrow I'm giving a talk on looking at uh, the situation in the Balkans and particularly Greece. And the uh, European Commission has just uh, uh, intr has introduced a 100 million euro program of support for micro microcredit for Greece. And the idea is that um, uh, you know unemployed uh, Greeks will be able to access you know a couple of thousand dollars and start a new coffee bar or uh, some you know some simple low-tech, low-capital type of business. And, um, uh, and then when it was pointed out to them that statistics on failures, so something like half of all the micro-enterprises went out of business in the last five years because nobody's got any money. So what good is actually trying to start up businesses in the same sector? Um, and when I wrote to the Commission on this and said, look, I mean, this absolutely makes no sense, they wrote back to me and said, well, our data actually shows that ent micro credit will be good because the rate of micro enterprises, they're, they're doing very well. And from data we have from 2001 to 2004, oh, no, that was the start of the credit-led boom. Uh, the situation is totally different now. So that's one of the big problems. If you don't factor in the exit side, you only get the upside and you lose the downside. Cash transfers, um, I haven't done that much on them, so I don't, I don't know that much about uh, how they work. But I, I do, there is one problem with them, and that if, if it's a form of giving, in a sense, uh, uh, not a microloan, but a grant, uh, okay, so there's no interest to pay. But the sort of business you can start with a cash transfer, um, if that's what you're going to use with it um, is, is still a micro enterprise and they have, as I said, a very, very poor track record of being associated with development. If it's just a cash transfer as a form of income, I don't know. I mean, I, I, don't, I really don't have that much data to know whether that's a good thing. There was an article actually in the, Tom mentioned the latest edition of Jacobin, there was an article on cash transfers, very critical of it, and I read that, but I don't know that much. But, but if it's about cash transfers to start businesses, then the same problems as you have with microcredit arise. Um, the question over here about, st about why, uh, you know, this, this, the, the, the two reasons why the financial inclusion movement has taken off I don't think that, I mean, I think the state provides support for microcredit in the sense of the regulatory framework and the, 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 the advocacy and those sorts of things. But I don't think the state provides a lot of money. The most, most of the finance now going into microcredit is from Wall Street and from hedge funds and from Bill Gates and from, you know, uh, conventional private sector funds looking for big returns. Um, uh, the Indian microcredit sector was boosted up by a lot of hedge funds. They were getting 8%, 12%, 8 percent, 12 percent, 8 to 12 percent on on the money they were lending to microcredit institutions for on lending at 40 percent. Uh, Bosnia is the same; they're getting up to 15 percent, and then the microcredit institution on lends it at 40 percent. Um, so, the, really, the state doesn't need to put any of its own money up front. They, do, you know, because the, the private sector has realised there is a seriously good business opportunity now in microcredit, but they have to get the regulations right, and that's where the state plays a role in making sure you have a light touch regulatory uh, environment, allowing these companies, and most of them suspiciously are based in Luxembourg and Netherlands, um, and uh, you know, so what are they doing there? Um, so, and Switzerland. 
So it's because it's low, regulate, low regulation, so they can do all sorts of things. So the state doesn't get involved in financing. It's, it provides the regulatory support to allow these companies to do what it is they want to do. Okay. Uh, the final one, um, the self-help movement keeps coming back. Uh, I, I mean, if, if the poor are lend taking money in order to finance consumption, I think then I think the self-help group is a much better than taking it from your average microcredit institution. So I think that's absolutely fine. The problem I have is that when you say they take it through the self-help group to start a business, because if they're taking $500 and opening a shop on the street, then that runs up against the same problem that microcredit creates. In other words, the type of businesses you create with that sort of money are not the businesses that are historically associated with getting out of poverty reduction. Countries that get out of poverty actually get rid of those types of businesses as they move in a different direction. So actually starting to allocate money into inflating that sector is actually in a sense going backwards. Um, so I think, I think the self-help movement is, is a step away from microcredit, but of those who advocate that, that, that it's better to take money to start a business from a self-help group, you're still not going to really contribute very much. Thank you. Uh, yes. Mm. And they are again tying up with microfinance organizations for poor to take loan from a microfinance to be able to fund consumption of these products. Mm. Mm. So generally, I just wanted to give your opinion. And you have the corporations investing in them and venture capital funds, all of them putting in money into it. So I want to mm. understand your opinion. Thank you. Yes. Uh, as, a, as a practitioner of microfinance from a Muslim organization, I'd just like to ask you, have you done any study on microfinance? There are Islamic microfinance, which is just interest in another way. I mean, that, that's really true. A lot, lot, lot of Islamic, Islamic banking has nothing to do. It's just, in, just using different Arabic terms for interest. But there are microfinance in the Islamic world, which are based on Pat Hassan, which is a loan, and you only pay back exactly what you, you borrow. And I've been involved in some of these, and these do seem to... Have you done any study on the impact of this? Because there's no big, there's no interest to pay, mm. Mm. Uh, and, and and people do manage to escape from poverty. As well as this, Brat has given some very good lessons on uh, if you're starting with the ultra poor, and, and a lot of the emphasis is on the ultra poor. Uh, you do need in the initial stages cash transfers, you need food support, you need health support. So there is a, a whole scheme of helping the ultra poor. So I, I just wondered if you've done any study on that. Uh, uh, from our perspective, uh, as a development organization, it's only one tool in the kit to help people. It's not the, the only, microcredit isn't the only, the only answer. You have to deal with uh, other issues. And finally, you know, some microcredit uh, organizations, they have what they call a risk fund. So should there be like a cyclone in Bangladesh, or, or their house burns down. So their loan is written off. They're given another, uh, you know, they rebuild their house and they're given another chance to start their business. So have you done any study on those sort of things and, and what is your opinion about that? Thank you. There was a question at the back. Was there another question at the back, Georgos? Yeah. I think I understood the question uh, before slightly different. So wh why does it persist? Why, why does it persist? Uh, if it has so many busts, so from the point of view of investors, you said they make eight percent or ten percent, but at some time, sometimes, at some point, it goes bust. So, and then you said the state doesn't step in to guarantee the payment. So, how does this oh. make financial sense from their point of view? Okay. okay. Can I answer that one? Can I? We've got one more. Have, how many additional questions have we got? We got one here. Okay. Let, let's do. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <coughs> um, hi. Uh, nice to presentation. I know nothing, so this is maybe a bit um, louder. If you can. Yeah. How has the 
how has the economic profession responded as a whole to its failure now that um, the ideological debate um, seems to have uh, it or, or has it at, at all? Or is it still, you know, Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, the first question was about the bottom of the pyramid um, type of uh, the multinationals get into providing tiny uh, amounts of, of, of shampoo or whatever to, to the poor. I haven't done that much work um, on that, um, that sort of strategy. I've got a chapter coming out, a book we've got coming out on social enterprises and I I use the social enterprises set up uh, by Mohammed Yunus under the Grameen family network to have a look at and to critique that. So the idea that um, uh, multinational corporations or even Grameen bank affiliates can get into the idea um, of, uh, of supplying uh, these types of, of products to the poor um, uh, is not perhaps a valid argument. Um, the one, the one example I looked, at, we, we we looked at was uh, a, a tie-up between Grameen and Danone, which is one of the big uh, companies, and it's pr about providing yogurt um, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to to the to the rural poor in Bangladesh, and 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 buying from farmers the milk, and uh, it's a very complicated process. Um, it involves a multinational company, which is now using that the sort of the capital. Um, you know, the reputational capital they've built on helping the poor to get into other markets in Bangladesh without any regulation, with buying licenses very cheaply. So I'm, I'm a bit suspicious about Danone's has a reputation for doing some, some dodgy things there. And the important thing is that it's not as good as a similar program in India called Operation Flood, which is pretty solidly uh, evidence that it had a very important impact when the poor were forming milk cooperatives. But Danone didn't, and Grameen Danone doesn't go into that. They didn't want the idea of cooperatives smelled a little bit too collective. So they wanted a very, uh, uh, a very sort of individualistic. But Operation Flood <laughs> seems to have done a lot better. Um, but they weren't interested in what was best, which makes me suspicious that if you're interested in supporting initiatives to help the poor, then you look at all the alternatives. And if there's one next door in India, which seems to be working, why do you choose one with a multinational company involved? You know, you've got to think through that one. So on the Islamic finance, I've had this many, uh, you know, I've, I've I haven't really looked at Islamic finance at all. Um, so I've got no real comment to make on that other than if, if it is about creating the same types of small informal businesses, then it again runs up with the same barrier that all other programs that support informal businesses run up against, that the, they are not the driver of development. Um, you know, I mean, it's fairly uh, clear that that is not the way um, uh, development takes place. It's, it's formal SMEs or large companies. It's not informal micro enterprises. Now, this wouldn't matter very much if only a tiny amount of your financial resources went on these programs. In a sense, you could experiment. But if you're saying, as in the example I gave, if 40% of, of Cambodia's financial resources are now intermediated through into informal micro enterprises, that's a game changer. That means that but Cambodia will never escape poverty if most of its resources are creating street sales. I mean, that's not good, or, or, or consumption lending. So that's the problem I have with that. Even though I appreciate the subtleties of Islamic finance, it might actually provide a better service. The ultimate outcome is, is, pretty, much the, is pretty much the same. Um, on the issue of uh, the Boston, when, when I said that the, the state provides the regulatory background, um, but the, the state, and this is the Wall Street style, um, uh, the Wall Street aspect to microcredit, uh, in the run-up, where so when microcredit is expanding, the owners and the shareholders are making out like bandits. Um, and then when the whole thing goes bust, then the state is called to, to come in and clear up the mess. So it's very much a Wall Street scenario. And we had a, gr a great example in inverted commas, in uh, South Africa, where we had a com uh, an organization called African Bank. Now, it was basically a reckless lending. It was pumping out money into the poorest communities. When people were struggling, they would be given another loan, part of which you used to pay off the existing one, and then you carried on, the, you know, so it was like a Ponzi scheme. And eventually, this Ponzi scheme blew up. And it cost the South African government, because uh, they came in, they had to bail it out. 
on the basis that it would create so much uh, anger uh, if they didn't. Um, and they paid something like, or they bailed it out to the tune of around 1.6 billion US dollars. So basically the private sector interest took the money on the way up. When it all went bust, they stepped back in the state. So that's pretty much out, straight out of Wall Street's playbook. Um, and, uh, and the main shareholders were pension funds, uh, investment funds, and a lot of government personnel. So it wasn't even the poor they were bailing out. It was middle class, mainly white, institu owned institutions that they, were bailing, that they were bailing out. So that's what happens when it goes wrong. Bosnia has got a similar, when several of them bust, the government has to go in. I mean, in, in Bosnia now, uh, uh, several of them have gone bust, and there is a big problem of over-indebtedness in Bosnia. So one of the biggest international aid programs is called PLUS, and it is about debt counselling to the poor and advising them not to access a microcredit. Um, so for 10 years, they've been telling the poor that this is your salvation. They're now spending something like eight, nine, ten million dollars on programs in all the major indebted cities in Bosnia, actually bringing people in who are over indebted and trying to counsel them out of it, but also having a general message, you know, by all means, you know, just, just stay away from it. So that's how much it's gone full circle. So it's a bit crazy. Um, what was the last question? I was first to respond. Oh, yeah, that's an interesting one. How have the economics profession responded to failure? Um, I, f I mean, this is uh, very interesting because um, many of the, uh, uh, well, just recently, I think I mentioned that um, uh, several high profile professors from the top US institutions, MIT, Yale, Harvard, have come out with a series of of reports that basically say that, you know, yes, there's, there's no impact from microcredit. It, it's so small, and it might even be negative, but it's so small we can't even identify it. And in a sense, they, these, are in, these are economists who, have, who in earlier times built their reputation on microcredit. And the way you build your reputation in the United States is you get research funding to produce articles. So as long as they were selling microcredit in the 19, late 1990s, early 2000s, they were getting, they were inundated with financial, with funding. So much so, and it's a fairly common career path in you know, academic circles, you open your own NGO. So several of the most high profile open fin institutions that now evaluate, and they got tons of money from the Gates Foundation, USAID, all the main microcredit parties and institutions. So it was interesting that the way that they've dealt with the fact that after all these years, it now turns out that there's nothing in it. How do they respond? Well, what they're doing is they're taking the lead. And I saw a couple of um, uh, 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 tweets by one of them that was, and this is one of them that built the whole model up and built a career. And now he was challenging other people to say, uh, you know, look, these things don't work. Is that what you other guys think in the practical field? Because we don't think it works. So in other words, taking the lead as being one of the people saying it's not working. So they've come full circle. And uh, it's, it's really quite strange. I mean, there's a, there's, a, uh, there's a sort of saying about first they repose you, then they accept you, then they say, well, we knew this all along. So I, I think there's a case on that. Many... Uh, uh, but I mean, it's the, we've all seen inside job. Yeah, I mean, you know, we know how um, uh, the US academic profession was, I mean, Wall Street was very, very much insinuated in all, into all the cracks and fissures in the US academic profession. People got lots of money to write, you know, reports, 20 page, saying that deregulation is an absolute must for Wall Street without then saying who was paying them to, to say that. And I think there's a lot of that in microcredit. I mean, a lot of people have had, you know, have been taking a hell of a lot of resources in order to say things which now turn out not to have been right. And some people are keeping quiet, but some people are going on the offensive and saying, you know, well, we knew this was not right. And, you know, what are you guys going to say? Sort of saying that as though they were there all the time sort of thing. So, so yes. Uh, well, it's strange. I mean, he's, uh, uh, he came under a lot of criticism recently and, um, uh, because of the mismanagement of the Grameen Bank and lots of things went on there which were bad. And it was interesting to see how um, when the, the government, the Bangladesh government came in and then said, look, you know, so many things we've got to, and they sacked him basically. So he was sacked. Now, supporters, including Bill and Hillary Clinton and others said it was because of the politics. 
but they then commission an independent report on what's been going on in the Grameen family. So it's not just the bank, it's the fami family of social enterprises. And what they found was astounding mismanagement, corruption, etc, etc, etc. The report went out there and not one single Western media outlet picked it up. If you can get it, you just Google Grameen, uh, Grameen Bank uh, Intermediate... Uh, uh, what's he called, Mark? An intermediate report or something. Interim report. Interim report. Ministry of Finance, Bangladesh. And you go through that, and it's a really savage indictment of what went on there, how they mismanaged it. Um, you know, this was not about poverty reduction. It was. It was. It was. There were lots of all sorts of other things, but nobody picks it up. Um, and so, but but. Professor Yunus is still a major figure. He carries on all over the world speaking and, and stuff like that. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, he's, he's moved out of microcredit now and he moves into something called social business. So this is the new way that poverty is going to be uh, uh, eradicated. And actually, we did a chapter on this in this book coming out, um, looking at that social business model and whether there was any, any water in that. But... Uh, I, I think it's very difficult if you, 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 you start something and then things later on come apart and, you know, it's, it must be very difficult. <laughs> Thank Don't you, Mufu. Um, okay, um, a question there. How many more questions have I got? One here and one here. Okay, three questions and that will be it. Is that okay? So just before we move into the questions briefly, next Tuesday, John martinez Allier. Uh, next Tuesday at 5 o'clock on Is There a Global Movement for Environmental Justice? And after this round of questions and Milford's answer, little reception upstairs at the Senior Common Room for anyone who's interested. Yes, please. So, first of all, I love the talk in here. Jack was in essay. It was great. So, you say that um, micro-enterprises, informal micro-enterprises, don't uh, produce development, that you need larger... Um, businesses and more, it sounds like you're advocating more high-tech things. Mm -hmm. um, but, and that's because that's produced um, development in the past. And I would ask you if you think that the development that's happened in the past has been desirable from a social perspective, the sorts of unequal outcomes that we've had. And then also um, from an environmental perspective, it looks like repeating that sort of development isn't possible, at least if we want to have a, a stable mm. climate. And so is it so bad to be looking at alternatives? Mm. Um, there was a question from, yes. Yeah, um, yeah, I was very interested in your talk. Um, I was wondering if you could just speak more about the beginnings of microcredit in Central America, because this is something I, I just haven't heard very much about. I've read a lot about its failures today, but this whole period of history generally isn't really discussed. Thank you. Yes. Hi, yeah. Hi. Um, my question is actually about uh, digital finance, so mobile money. So I kind of, in my opinion now, is maybe we're giving too much lip service to microfinance, and actually the majority of um, donor funds which are going towards financial inclusion at the moment are actually being funded into mobile money, so like the test model that we see in Kenya. And there's been great results, and um, it's all about obviously um, improving the of how people store their money, but also um, in terms of affordability as well, it's definitely cut down on the transaction costs. So it's been ama amazing, successful results. And I was wondering what your thoughts are. You know, is maybe this is the next area that we should focus on? Okay, yeah. Okay. And sorry, I just I need to intervene just because I would be remiss not to ask this question. What is your response to the claim of gender empowerment in microfinance? Less about the industrialization capacity, but what it does for women. Okay. Or can. Yeah. Okay. The, uh, I mean, I, I take your point about past development, and uh, uh, there are lots of problems with um, uh, formal, small, medium, large enterprises. Uh, you know, I mean, that's not a panacea either. But uh, putting it very basically, I mean, countries have got richer and at least have freed up resources to all sorts of other things. So to the extent that they've been able to channel what finance they have into the most valuable uses. So that tends to be formal, small, medium and large enterprises. Now this, as I said earlier, this wouldn't really matter if microcredit only absorbed a tiny percentage of the, of the finance that a developing country has, then we wouldn't be so worried about it. Um, it would be a bit like uh, uh, somebody says, look, I think 
um, uh, developing countries want Rubik's cubes. I think Rubik's cubes are fantastic because they they encourage manual dexterity and thought processes. So I think we, sh you know, developing countries need Rubik's cubes. We might say something in that maybe. You know, if you want to go off and send your own money and maybe you know do something with it but if the person said well no actually I don't want to do that but what I want to do is I want to make I want to close down all other development interventions and put, concentrate the money on Rubik's cubes so that's when we would say well hang on you need more evidence that that's something good you know so it's the amount of money that's going into as I say Cambodia 40 percent now goes into informal micro enterprises so all the other types of enterprises are reporting to the World Bank and the IFC and all the others that they are having a cash crisis. They call it the missing middle problem. So all this money is going into microcredit and creating very little impact and it's taken away from the businesses that they're not perfect but we know that they're associated more with sustainable development. Now I agree that they're not the right way and I would like to see lots of even better types of institutions like workers cooperatives, municipal enterprises, that sort of thing. But you know that's not the option that we're talking about. We're talking about whether money, a, sc a scarce funds goes into informal micro enterprises or it goes into more formalized but more risky types of businesses. Well the historical evidence is very much that you have to put it into the formal small, medium, large enterprises. That seems to be the historical evidence. Central America, I'll give you something on that uh, rather than talk over it again. I've just uh, got, um, uh, I did a, a, a chapter on something, an introductory chapter, so I'll let you, ha I'll let you have that if you see me at the reception. Um, mobile money is now one of the, that's part of this financial inclusion thing and everybody's waxing lyrical about it. I think it sounds like a good, a good idea that if you don't carry physical cash, you have it on your mobile phone. I think there are lots of good things and everybody's talking up M-Pesa and everything. I think the downside to that is, and, and this has been said on several occasions, that it's now very easy, at the click of a button, a poor person can take a microloan out. Well, I think that's a good thing, but I also think that's, if we already know that there is a massive over-indebtedness uh, problem in so many countries, are we not adding a little bit of fuel to the fire on that? And I mean, the Kenyan, I haven't got the latest, but the Kenyan over-indebtedness statistics are pretty scary. Uganda is one of the worst, um, and uh, the South African government don't want M-Pesa in there. They've put lots of problems in their way. And because they think that South Africans, the poor, are already so much over indebted, uh, you know, and they have to go to a bank, sign forms, do all that. If they could just click a button, the, the problem would be magnified. So I think there are some great things with that. And I think it's fantastic that technology seems to have a usefulness. But I think, you know, I'd be a little bit worried, uh, you know, if, then, if there isn't a strict application of this. And I'm also worried about the people pushing it, the likes of Visa and MasterCard and Citigroup and Barclays Bank. If it, w if it was Oxfam and others largely doing the driving, I would feel a, lo a lot more comfortable about that. And the final one, gender empowerment. Yeah, I didn't talk about that because uh, I didn't have any uh, a, a time to go on about that. I think there has been a couple of studies out, n out now that basically say this was very much part of the myth. Uh, of micro of micro credit and um, uh, certainly my own experience is in Bosnia where we had a very famous uh, called Women for Women International if anybody's come across it uh, and it basically was taking women in the post-conflict environment giving them a couple of hundred dollars and then setting themselves up in you know the most tiniest unsustainable business possible and um, a couple of years later all of them basically all these businesses collapsed and uh, it created so many problems of indebtedness and uh, it, it was a, a disastrous intervention for women that they were really corralled into the least sustainable businesses possible. I mean, that was, that was part of the problem. But also the feminist movements in places like Bosnia were against microcredit because their point was that, look, under the old system, for good or bad, in Yugoslavia, as it was, um, uh, there was a lot of g real gender empowerment. I mean, there was a very strong feminist movement. It was one of the pioneers, in a sense, behind in the, in the communist countries in terms of gender empowerment. And, and gender empowerment was equated with things like, you know, distribution of women in, in the parliament and in government jobs and in all sorts, in the, the professions which are typically male dominated. So they had made real inroads. And then gender empowerment in the new neoliberal era was 
uh, in terms of can you get hold of a microcredit and you're expected to, as one person said, you know, keep a cow in the back garden and that's, that's empowerment. And a lot of people said, well, that's not empowerment as we understand it. The World Bank might think that's empowerment, but a lot of feminist groups were against uh, what was going on there. I'm not saying Bosnia is the only one, but I've heard that same sort of argument being in, in, in many other countries that, you know, simply allowing... Uh, somebody, uh, you know, uh, uh, to uh, access a couple of hundred dollars to go and st stand on a table selling avocados in a street, you know, that's not empowerment. In, in a sense, that, as I, I wrote in the book, I mean, that's really the only empowerment there is that the market is being empowered because what, what you're saying is that women, to get um, real empowerment, the only avenue that's open to them is through informal micro-enterprises. They shouldn't be going out there calling for you know, mobilization for real gender empowerment, you know, you'll find empowerment through microcredit, and that's not on. Final question I would answer, uh, I would say to that, is that Bolivia had, a, prior to 1980, I mean, they had many economic problems, <laughs> but they had built up a fairly uh, co comprehensive social welfare system, which was very gender empowerment, powering. And this was built up under the old military government and the, the elected governments. But it was seen widely as carry, having many attributes of a fairly gender empowered country with, with maternity leave and all sorts of other aspects. And when uh, Bolivia had a, a bit, a bit of a problems and the World Bank and IMF and Jeffrey Sachs came in, they basically destroyed all that that infrastructure of empowerment and said if women want to be empowered they should take a microcredit and buy these services on the private market. So I think that is perhaps the most disempowering act you can make. You, you, the empowering is valuable only to, which, uh, only to the extent that it can be achieved through market means which is not real empowerment. Fantastic. Thank you so much Milford. Absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant session. Thank you very, very much. And thanks, everyone, uh, for uh, coming. And I hope I'll see you at upstairs. <laughs>